Hello? Are you there? Dear church, when did you trade your daily bread for daily news? Pockets feel tight when it's time to count the cost, but your pay-per-view. Speak up for your stance on politics, but speak on Jesus and all of a sudden you scared of joblessness. Conservative versus liberal, a house divided. The bride of Christ looks more like she's the bride of Trump or Biden. Senselessly living as if we don't smell death's aroma. It seems like you lost your taste for grace way before Corona. The bride that always needs more, you sing, all I need is you, Lord. Plus a spouse, plus a house, plus a large bank account. I know all you need is Jesus, but seems you want him to play a role in the film you play the lead in. They say, only God can judge me, and that he will. Which is why Christ paid the price with every lash and nail, resurrected from the tomb, and because of that, we will. They might take your body, but body, listen, your soul will not be killed. Prisoners to comfort, slaves to sin, locked in cells, adopted by the one that we sought to kill. Now, how we live is a reflection if we think this is false or real. It's real. Good morning. So up, coming up on the screen, there's a quote that we're going to begin off this morning with. And so C.S. Lewis says this in his book called The Problem of Pain. He says, there is no doctrine which I would more willingly remove from Christianity than this, if it lay in my power. But it has the full support of scripture and especially of our Lord's own words. It has always been held by Christendom and it has the support of reason. So before I tell you what he's talking about, What runs through your guys' mind? You don't have to shout them out, but just taking that moment to think if you agreed and believed what he was talking about at that beginning of saying, if I could remove this from Christianity, I would remove this doctrine. And I know there's probably different things that have ran through our mind, but the thing that Lewis is talking about here in particular is God's judgment in hell. And as we hear that, I think for a lot of us, that was probably the one we were thinking about. And that seems to resonate so much with our souls. If, if we could, because it feels awkward at times, it feels severe, like why does it have to be this way? Why does hell even have to exist? There's this wrestling with inside of us. And so some reasons that I think it does resonate so much with us, that statement, is because for a lot of us, we would say, if I were God, I wouldn't send anyone to hell. That's too much because we believe that we're good and we're kind and that just seems like too long, an eternity in punishment and torment. And so to a degree, that makes sense because the Bible tells us God does does not delight in the destruction of the wicked. So it's not God just enjoying and laughing, laughing about it. But as we see with that mindset, there's a deeper problem, I think, inside of us that in reality, we just don't see sin as bad. So hell seems so repulsive and excessive because we don't do that much bad things. I get it for guys like Hitler, but for the majority of us where the worst thing we feel like we've done is I may have cheated on my taxes here or there, or I might get angry in traffic or something that we might not feel is that bad or whatever else that we justify. But ultimately, it comes back to this place where sin is just not that bad. And then on the contrary, on the other side, it makes sense that Jesus would save us because we can worship him and we can do so much for the kingdom and he, so he needs us. And so I think with those two things in our mind, we don't see hell as that bad and even more so, if we could, we would get rid of it. And so there's similar ideas about hell like that or other things and lines of where God doesn't send anyone to hell, but rather they go there by themselves. And so even in those, there's a twinge of truth that people who end up in hell They do by their own choice. There is a choice in there, but it takes away the side of it on God's end where there's a legitimate judgment upon them. And so with statements like the Lewis one, with different thoughts that we have about hell, what I want to put before us this morning is that there's a danger in trying to get rid of the doctrine of hell. And as many of you guys know here, we believe strongly in the scriptures. We believe that the scriptures are our guide to how we are to live before the Lord and how we are to love and all these different things. And so when it comes to topics like homosexuality, we would agree, all right, the Bible speaks clearly, we cannot go against it. Or we have other things that the culture may speak against like complementarianism or the exclusivity of Christ. And we can go down the line 
of different doctrines that the scriptures speak clearly to, but the culture speaks opposite. And so we say, no, we can't bend to the culture. And so in that similar vein, we have to take that same mindset when it comes to the righteous judgment of God. That when God's word speaks, no matter how it makes us feel, how uncomfortable, or how repulsive we may think that may be, or even our culture speaks against it, we cannot bend on that. And so that's where we're going to be this morning in 2 Thessalonians. So I encourage you, if you have your phone, to put it to the side. We have some paperback Bibles to grab one and to open up to 2 Thessalonians. And so as you guys open up there, because I believe this is such a heavy topic and so much of us have gone through our weeks and some of us are already looking forward to all the stuff we're going to do later and moving into Monday, just want to give a moment and a time for us in just a couple seconds to just slow down to breathe, to go before the Lord in prayer, because this is a weighty and heavy topic. So I want to give you guys that moment, and I'll pray for us, and then we'll jump into 2 Thessalonians. Lord, we thank you for this morning and just the ability to slow down, to go before your word and see what does your word say. And Lord, as we see what it says, help us to receive it, receive it willingly to receive it as good and true and just and lovely. And Lord, where our heart wrestles, where our heart desires to jump up and try to reject you, Lord, I pray that you may quench and still all rebellion within us so that we submit to you, Lord, because you are good and you are just, and you are loving. And so, Lord, this morning, help us to just meditate and see what does your word say. And we thank you for this time, and we thank you for all these things, because it is by your good providence and your good grace that we can resolve to be able to love you and know you. And so we bring all these things before you this morning, Lord Jesus. Amen. So as I said, we're going to be in 2 Thessalonians. We're going to be in chapter 1, verses 5 through 12. And so last week, Aaron kicked us off with our new series in 2 Thessalonians. And in the first four verses, Paul begins off by just praising God and commending the Thessalonican church for, as he says in verse 4, Therefore we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. So there was a growing faith. There was a thriving faith in this church, and Paul is commending them and also praising God for what he has seen, in particular because the culture as it is, even in our own day, is going against that, is calling them to compromise, calling them to bend over to the will of those around us and not to the Lord. But what we see here in this church and also the call for us is that we remain steadfastness, steadfast in faith in the midst of persecution, tribulations, and any other offer to compromise. And so now we pick up in verse 5, where Paul begins and says this. This is the evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you are also suffering. So to get a better understanding of what Paul is talking about here in this evidence of the righteous judgment of God, let's turn over just a couple books to Philippians. You keep your finger in 2 Thessalonians. But we're going to be looking at Philippians 1, verse 6, and then we're going to look at 27 through 28. So here Paul helps us understand what does he mean by this. So in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, it says this. And I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So Paul here instructing the Philippian church is letting them know that when God begins a good work in somebody, this justifying, saving faith, when he begins this good work, he's going to bring it to completion. And so as we can see evidences of it in time, we know that God will complete it. He's not going to start his work and then drop it off. And then the second passage in Philippians 1, verses 27 and 28, Paul says this, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you, that you are standing firm in one spirit 
with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel and not frightened in anything by your opponents. Look what he says here. This is a clear sign, so the evidence to them of their destruction, but for you, of your salvation and that from God. And so Paul here in instructing them is letting them know their ability to stand side by side, to stand firm in their faith, striving for the gospel in the midst of their opponents, in the midst of those who are going against them is a clear sign of their destruction, but on the faith of the believers of their salvation. And so Paul beginning here, going back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5, where he says, this is the evidence of the righteous judgment. He is letting them know, because in the midst of this, and we'll see this even more next week, there are all these false ideas of God's judgment has already come. That there's letters even Paul refers to of people saying that it has already came and gone. And so Paul is reminding them and encouraging them, this is the evidence of God's righteous judgment that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. And so he is telling them your ability to have steadfastness in faith in the midst of persecution and tribulations is evidence of God's righteous judgment, meaning they are going to be considered worthy of the kingdom that they're suffering for. And so what this instructs with us is that our suffering, our going through difficulty as often we can push it off and say this is God's anger against his people, but often it's his way of refining us. And in the midst of suffering, our faith is not made, but it's demonstrated through suffering. And so when we have hardship, when we have difficulty, as they did, it proves and shows our faith is genuine and real. And so as it happened to them, that the Lord uses that to demonstrate this to them. And then he says that, it's for the kingdom of God. And this is instructed for us because often when we think about suffering, we can just throw every single thing into that vein, everything into that box. So any kind of pain, any kind of distress, any hardship is automatically, oh, we're suffering for Christ. But when we consider truly what suffering is, it has to be for Christ. So some things that are not suffering in our time if for Christ. So the mere fact that our shipping is taking a little bit longer than we would like, or that there's delays in that home project that we want to do, or that gas prices are through the roof again, or even, as sadly, the price of chicken wings are going up so high, and it's hard to get a good chicken wing, or even the one that still doesn't make sense to me, and I just probably should look it up, but that we have cream cheese shortage. So there's all these things that are happening within our society that are difficult and they're frustrating and we can put it up to this is suffering and we're going through so much difficulty. But this is not what Paul is talking about. There's a qualification on the suffering and it's suffering for the kingdom of God. And so it's when you're going through that distress, that hardship, because you identify with Jesus, because you are desiring to live for him, desiring to be bold for him or anything else for his kingdom, when you suffer for that, Paul's saying this is a actually good thing because it's demonstrating that one, we're aligned with him, and we're going to see this more towards the end of the passage, but even those who are in opposition are not just hating us, but they're hating the Lord primarily. And so Paul begins there, but then he says on the other side of this judgment. So for us being worthy of the kingdom of God, but in verse 6 he says, since indeed God considered it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you. So some of you guys have probably heard of this guy's name, but it's a gentleman by the name of Mike Civarella. So back in two, between 2003 and 2008, and actually coming into the later 2000s, he made headlines in the news. And so he was a judge in Pennsylvania, and some of the cases, to give you an example of how he became infamous, was, first one was an 11-year-old girl, got two years at this detention center, there was a particular detention center, for taking her mom's car out for a joyride. So she got two years, right, for that. Another person going to the same detention center was a 15-year-old, got sent to the detention center for mocking their principal on MySpace. And for those who don't know what MySpace is, it was before the Facebook time. <laughs> but, and then continuing on, another one was a 17-year-old got five months for help 
for helping to steal a DVD. And with these, and there was thousands of cases that he had where he got named Mr. Zero Tolerance. So for some of us, we hear those and it's like, eh, it don't seem that bad. They deserve that. That's what they should have got. And if you're thinking that's why he made national headlines, that's not why. The reason why is, like I said, there was thousands of cases. Those are just examples of some was because what he was doing, he was sending to a particular detention center because he was getting a kickback. So much so that they said the amount of money that was getting racketed up was close to $2 million. So he's getting money for sending these kids away, and there's actually, and I don't know if it's still there, but there was a documentary on Netflix called Kids for Cash. And so this story hit headlines because it was this corruption in the judicial system, and doesn't this, we qualify this by saying this does not mean all judges are corrupt at all. But I use the example of Mike Civarella because often when we think about the judgment of God, we project that onto him, that his justice is corrupt, that he's doing it for some ulterior motive, he's doing it some, for some wrong motivation. But the thing about it is in God's judgment, in his justice, he is impartial, he's righteous, he's above appeal and without dispute, and so there is no kickback that God is getting. There is no corruption in his judgment, but it is pure and just. And in the words of Paul Washer, as he says, this is man's greatest problem, that God is good and that he is just and that he will not leave the guilty unpunished. And so for those, as Paul says here, that God is going to repay them with affliction, those who afflict you, he is letting us know that God is not going to be partial in his judgment and even more so a comfort to those who are being afflicted. And so for those who are going through this time and desiring to seek back out that vengeance or that retribution, Paul's telling them, no, 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 the Lord will take care of that. And so for us in like manner, as we have desires to get vengeance back or retribution when somebody mocks us for our faith or is coming after just Christianity in its whole, in reality, what we should do is we should pray for them. Because if we know that God is going to inflict judgment upon them, let's pray for them. Look at even the example of Christ when he's being assaulted, he's being mocked, he's being beaten, and he's praying for them. And so that is an example for us that we know that those who afflict believers, those who go against the Lord, that the Lord will repay them. And it's just, it is good. But... Paul doesn't stop there. He continues on in verse 7, and he says, And to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. And so God is promising this relief on our behalf and for the Thessalonican church that they will get this relief. But when it will happen is when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and flaming fire. And so it gives us this picture, and there's so much symbolism but a reality of the Lord being revealed from heaven. So meaning that for a time, as we know right now, we can't physically see Jesus. But we know that he exists, we know that he is real, we know that he is true. But there will come a time where that will no longer be, but he will be seen in all of his glory and his majesty, and we will see him, and he will be revealed from heaven meaning that he is coming from a place of authority, a place of power. He's descending, he's coming to us, and he has an accompaniment with him. He has mighty angels and flaming fire, and this is a picture of judgment. And so this picture that the scriptures are painting for us is one of the Lord coming back with judgment and vengeance on those who afflict his people, those who are in opposition, and he even clarifies it here more in verse 8 where it says, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. And so these are the people that he is coming to. And so the root cause of all of these issues, these problems, their desire to afflict God's people is not in and of us ourselves or in and of ourselves. So it's not just because they hate you. And sometimes we can be the reason why people mock or say things about the Lord. But ultimately, the root cause, the problem is they've rejected God. They don't know him. They don't obey his gospel. 
And when the Bible talks about us knowing God in Romans 1, it teaches us that to know God is not just about ignorance, but rather rejection. It says that all have an understanding in some sense of who God is, but they suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And so when it says that we do not know him, it is saying that we have rejected his truth. And it even goes deeper in if they have not obeyed the gospel. And I thought this was interesting because normally when we think about the gospel, we think of it as something to believe and trust in which it is. But there's a part of the gospel that it is a call to obey. That the Lord and what he has done is calling us to give up all hopes of trying to work, give up all rebellion, and come and submit. And so he's not just Savior, but he is Lord in this gospel proclamation that we have. And so it's not just a mental assent, I agree intellectually, but I actually submit to what he is saying. And so Paul is saying for those who do not know God, for those who do not believe the gospel, he is saying that the Lord Jesus Christ with his mighty angels in flaming fire from heaven is coming to inflict vengeance upon them. And then it continues to get worse that not only is it in this time, but in verse 9 it tells us that they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction. And so the reality is, even in this destruction, it is not as some would believe it to be of annihilation where it just ceases to exist. But this word for destruction is a sense of ruin in utter hopelessness. There is a destruction that is coming for them. There is a loss of everything that makes life worth living. And even as graphic as this language may be, it's even hard for us to really experience, to put, wrap our heads fully of this reality. And we can see this even in other things in life, and though the scriptures help us, there's still gonna be something missing until we see it in that time. And so, for example, if I hit my toe on this podium right here, many of you, and if I explained it to you, you could get a sense of what that means, but until you hit your foot and you know what it is to yell out in pain or whatever it may be, we don't fully understand. Or as you're dating, you're engaged, and a married couple tells you about the bliss of getting married and the bliss of being in those early stages, and there's ways that we can conceptualize and get it and understand it in concepts, but till we experience that, it's hard to communicate that. Or on the difficult side, when having to raise a little one. I used to hear it all the time is, it's going to be hard, it's going to be hard, it's going to be hard. All the sleepless nights early on and all those things, and especially being a younger father, I'm like, all right, I hear all that. We'll see about that. Until you're in the moment, and it's just like, this is the most frustrating thing that she won't listen, she won't go to sleep. Or even in some of the more heavier things of when you get that phone call that you're dreading, that phone call that that loved one that you didn't know was sick, that they quickly passed away in the night, and it just weighs on you. And you can communicate that to someone of what does it mean to lose someone you love, but it's hard to fully understand and grasp it until you're in the moment of it. And so examples like this, are helpful for us because it reminds us to a degree, though it's explained here, we will not fully grasp the magnificence of our Lord in this moment and the severity and pain that he is coming to inflict upon those who reject the gospel. And so Paul in here saying that it's internal destruction, but there's also one more thing that he says here at the end of verse nine. He says that it is away from the presence of of the Lord and from the glory of his might. So this past Wednesday in our student group, I used this illustration and we were talking about the death of Christ and particularly on the cross. And I was saying how often when we read that, we hear about that and that's probably the main thing that people know about Jesus and we can kind of gloss over that instead of slowing down to really think what does that mean. And so in the scriptures, and through ancient history, we get an understanding of what crucifixion was like. And so I apologize for those of you guys who are squeamish, but it'll drive home a point for us. And so what would happen in this time, the Romans constructed this horrific way of torture and pain. 
And so what they would do is, as you've been convicted and as we see with Christ in particular, you are put on a pole, right? So you're tied to a pole, your back exposed, and you are whipped. And not just a regular kind of whip, but there was a whip that at the end of it had leather straps. And at the end of these leather straps, there were sometimes metal balls, or if it was worse, there was sharp sheep teeth. So much so that when it hit your back, not only would it dig in, but it would rip through exposing your muscles. And so this is the pain that we see as happening to Christ. And after that, he's brought before, and there's a group of them, and they're mocking him and beating him, and they force a crown of thorns on his head. And we have pictures of that. We have crowns of thorns, and we put them up as imagery and things along that lines. But just imagine for a moment that as much as it hurts to just prick our finger on something sharp, but something to be forced upon your skull that is that sharp while you're being mocked and being beaten. And then you are forced to carry the beam of your cross, and Christ in particular, outside of the city. Then when you get to the cross, you're then going to be nailed into it. And so when we say nail, we can probably be visualizing nails, but in reality, it was spikes. And so it was driven through your hands and through your feet to hold you up on this wooden beam. And then you would think maybe they would just bleed out, but normally the way that you would die was actually by suffocating. Because as you were up there, and there's stories, even of some going a day or two, which doesn't make sense. Christ in particular was up there for six hours. You're held up there and you're trying to hold yourself up so that your lungs have the ability to expand, so that you can breathe. And what you would do is when your arms got tired, you would push up with your feet. And so what they would do, and though this didn't happen to Christ, what they would do is they would break their legs if they needed them to die quicker. And so all of that sounds horrific. It sounds painful. It says unimaginable. But what we see the scriptures tell us that in the midst of this, and I know it was painful, we don't see Jesus crying out. The one moment that he cries out, when he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so on that cross, in such a way that we will never fully understand, Jesus suffered what Paul is speaking about right here. That in that moment, all the sin, all the pain, all the destruction that you and I were supposed to take upon ourselves, he bore that. And so in his example, though the physical pain sounds horrific, even more so is what Paul says here when he says, away from the presence of the Lord. And so for us who are good theologians and know the word omnipresent, we're probably thinking, how can you be away from God's presence? He's everywhere at all times. And so when the Bible uses words like presence or even face and hands to describe God, it's using what we would call anthropomorphic language. So we use this in just regular speech and in particular with poetry. When we say the trees are dancing or we say that the wind is singing, so it's ascribing human characteristics onto something that is not human. And so when the Bible is speaking of God's presence, it means he is in a place to do something in particular. So it's often his presence to bless, of being able to be in the presence of the Lord, or his presence to judge. And so what Paul is telling us here is they will be away from his presence of blessing. And that's terrifying. And even R.C. Sproul has a great quote about this to kind of capture this for us is that the scariest thing about hell is not that God is not there, but rather that he is in wrath. And so as they are here, as this punishment is weighing upon them, the scariest, the weightiest is not only the physical, but the suffering of the soul, the despair, the hopelessness, the knowing that there is no other day, there is no morning coming, there is no second chance. It's heavy. It's weighty. It should bring us to a repentance. It should make us think deeply upon this and to get practical with it of why does this matter? Why does this matter that we have a correct understanding? Why does this matter that as we talk about such a heavy topic? So there's three things that I want to point out for us and some practical application to them. So our understanding of hell matters because it helps us to understand who God is. In particular, our appreciation of the cross. So as we look upon the cross, 
If there is no punishment, no wrath, no hell, no true judgment, then why did Christ suffer? Was it pointless? Did he just do it for the sake of being a good example? But when we truly consider the reality of hell, it helps us to understand better of what Christ suffered on the cross. And so my encouragement for you, my challenge for you guys, is take time to slow down and just meditate and think about what Christ did upon the cross. Meditate on how his mercy, his grace, his judgment, his wrath, all these things meet at the cross. And if we slow down and meditate and think about them, we would realize so much more of why our understanding of hell matters. Secondly, it helps us with our own selves. And so for us, as I've been talking about through this whole entire time, it brings this weightiness and this reality of what sin is. That it's not just trivial, it's not just something that I just made a mistake, but it is something that God would garner and say that it deserves eternal damnation. And so when we recognize the weightiness of this, and a practical way to put this in a place, is literally to grab a piece of pen, paper, use your phone, whatever it is, and just write down the things that the Lord has forgiven us of. Of being reminded that, hey, I used to be this, and I even presently still do these things, but yet he's forgiven me. And when we begin to see the list of things, we realize how weighty it is, and even more so, that yet he would still love us. Yet he would still forgive us. Yet he will still do what he did upon a cross. And when we're able to see that, we have a great appreciation for our own relationship with the Lord. And then thirdly, it helps us with one another. And so in our understanding of hell, it helps us to have greater motivation even in our evangelism. And so as we interact with one another, as each of you guys are sitting here this morning and my own self included, that I realize that what Paul is talking about here is for all men to hear and all women to hear, that the Lord is coming back for those who are his and also to inflict judgment upon them, and there is no hope after this. And so this should drive us to tears for those who we know who do not know the Lord. It should cause us to be able to preach the gospel because we know that there is coming a time when they will not have another chance. And so my challenge for you guys in a practical way is through this next week, just one person, one person, share the gospel with just one person. If you're great and you're able to do more, do more. But for each of us, if every single one of us, just one person, whoever that is, the Lord has on your heart. If you already have a person in mind or if you bring a random person into your life, but just share the gospel with one person because we realize the reality that Every single human being is either on a trajectory towards the Lord or away from him. And so that should weigh on us, and not in a guilty way, but a reality of, I don't want that for them. I want to proclaim to them the only message, the good news of Jesus Christ. The only thing that can save them is the Lord, and so I want them to know him. And so that's my challenges for you guys this week is to meditate on who God is and what he did in the cross to spend time writing down your own sins and realizing what he's forgiven you of. And then once we realize who he is, how that's affected us, and then we go out and share the gospel to at least one person. And so as Paul finishes off speaking about the judgment and punishment, we return back to 2 Thessalonians in verse 10, where he says this, when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at, among all who have believed, because our testimony to you was believed. And so as I imagine this moment when the Lord returns back, that there's going to be this utter astonishment. He even says that we're going to marvel at the reality of who he is and the glory that he comes in. And I don't think we're going to be like robots, all hands straight, just bowing down in the same exact way. But I believe there will be just this utter joy, this relief this finally. All of the pain, all of the suffering, all of the afflictions, all of the doubts, all the mocking are gone. He's before us. We no longer need faith because it is now sight. And it's just going to be this utter magnificent moment, just glorying and just praising him for who he is. 
And the reason why Paul says that we will be able to do this, he says, because our testimony to you was believed. And so what he means by this is the preaching of the apostles are in summary, the gospel was believed. And so in looking at the response and the glory and the praise from those who believed versus those who are in opposition who do not obey, it makes a really simple point for each of us as we talk about evangelism and the need for all of everyone to know is that every single human being, our ultimate destiny is contingent upon our reception of the gospel. And so whether we believe and trust in him by God's grace, which Paul is going to show us, or we reject him, and it hinges upon that. And so that's why this is such a weighty and such a thing for us to meditate upon is to proclaim the gospel, unhindered, unashamed, because of the reality of this. And then Paul finishes up in verse 11 and 12, and he says, to this end, so everything that we've just spoken about, we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul's prayer for them is that in the reality of all of this, how wonderful and yet still so severe in the reality of this, he prays for them that our Lord, our God, may make you worthy of his calling. So going back to the, you may be considered worthy, the way that we are made worthy is through Christ. It's through our God who accomplishes this. And then he tells us that we may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power. And so our ability to do good, to preach the gospel, to live in a way that's faithful to the Lord is all contingent of his power. And so we spent the first month this year going through that abide series and being reminded of that, of that we must abide in him. We must be connected to our source. It is only through Jesus that we can accomplish any of this. And that's what Paul is praying for, that those good desires, those good resolves that are in our heart and our mind are there by the Lord and by his power, he'll fulfill them. And so for us, as we desire to serve the Lord, and we can have bigger situations where it's deciding where to work, where to live, and things along that lines, but on a more simpler day-by-day way, when we run into situations and we're thinking through our mind, well, is this the Lord's will to do this or not do that? My advice and my counsel in that is it's better for us to err on the side of grace and good. And so what I mean by that is when we are placed with a situation of should I help this person or not? And obviously if you take a step back in certain situations, it's better for you not to enable. But when faced with those in those moments, too often we can put in our mind that hey, it's better for me not to do this because I can come up with so many different reasons. But if there's a good desire to serve someone something that's not naturally in us to preach the gospel. We can go on and on down the lines. It's better for us to err if we do on the side of grace and obedience to the Lord. And so Paul is calling us to this as those good desires to, that the Lord will fulfill them. And then all this is for this purpose in verse 12. So that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when the Bible speaks of a name, it's talking about all of who this person is. And so what Paul wants is that Jesus Christ to be exalted. That's the purpose of our good resolve. That's the purpose of this judgment, the purpose of his salvation. It is all to bring glory unto his name. And then even in here, there's vindication that he will be glorified, but also us with him. So all those who are mocking him, all those who are rejecting him and despising him, and us included, that we will finally be with him. And all of this, as we come to the end of this, is according to the grace of our God. It is only by his grace that we can do any of this. It is only by his grace that we have hope. It is only by his grace that we have a source of salvation, and it is only by his grace that we will make it to the end. Let us pray. Lord, I thank you so much for this morning. Lord, I know a topic like this is, 
heavy and weighty upon us because it's not theoretical. We realize within our own selves, either we're not in right standing with you or we have family members that we love deeply who do not know you. And Lord, we worry, we stress if, if they are chosen or not, Lord. So Lord, I pray for my own heart and for each of us sitting here that you may draw so many unto yourself. You may bring us to peace that knowing it is only by your grace and only by you, Lord, that any can come to you, Lord. And so in that, help us to be a people who proclaim the gospel unashamed, unhindered, who call others to repentance and not because we think it's in our ability or in the ways that we say it, Lord, but because we know you have called us to. And so, Lord, help us this morning to meditate upon what you did for us on the cross and how you would take on so much, Lord, for the sake of people who were your enemies and hated you, but yet you loved us. And so we thank you for that. We praise you for that. And it is in your name, Lord Jesus, that I pray. Amen.